Okay, Doc. This one states, uh, hello, I'm 41 and wasn't feeling as energetic a few years ago, so my doctor started me on HCG, human chorionic gonadotropin. The testosterone went up and I felt better for a while, but then it started to dwindle. A test back in February showed my testosterone levels back at the same numbers as before. The doctor then talked about exogenous testosterone and the delivery systems. He said that the cream is natural and has the least amount of side effects he puts in parentheses, acne and aggression. Uh, I tried one pump for a month. Prescription was for Versa Base one to two pumps, but I wanted to try the lower one first. Uh, putting it on my inner thigh, I did this along with HCG. After a month, my testosterone levels were the same and my doctor said that I might not be rubbing it in and up and, and to also go to two pumps on the back of each knee. I've been doing that for almost a month and rubbing it in much more. I'm going to get my blood work done again next week to see if the two pumps has been helping. I don't feel much different yet. My main question is, do you think the cream is, a, is as effective? I was thinking about moving over to sub-Q injections. Any insight is appreciated. Thanks for all you do. Uh, okay, where to start? So at age 41, the likelihood that HCG is going to work is pretty slim. I have seen uh, testosterone levels, total testosterone and free testosterone rise as a result of the stimulation from ACG. ACG is a homologue of luteinizing hormone, which is what the pituitary uh, produces to send a signal to test the testicles, the lytic cells specifically, to produce more testosterone. Um, but at 41, even if the numbers come up significantly, the patient, in my experience, says, okay, great, I see the numbers. I don't feel any different though. I don't feel good. So somewhere around, again, this is in my experience, around uh, 30 is when we start talking about, you know, you got a 50-50 shot here, no pun intended, was as whether or not you're gonna feel any different. And there are all kinds of factors that you wanna include in there. You know, are you gonna get, uh, are, are you looking to father a child soon? You know, um, you know, there's, there's emotional attachments to not being on uh, synthetic testosterone, even though you're on something else to, you know, this is certainly, none of this is natural, but you know, there, there's all kinds of things that come into play here. But um, what I don't have here to, to enable me to answer the question is I don't have milligrams. I don't have the dosage. What is one click? What is two clicks or whatever it is? Uh, is just clicks or pumps? I don't know what that equates to. Oh, yeah. And a lot of uh, physicians particularly those that don't have experience in this area, makes sense, right? Will uh, tend to underdose, mm -hmm. particularly with the creams and the other topical formulations because there you're gonna see more of a day-to-day -day increase and decrease, right? Much more of a fluctuation. That's why you have to put it on every day. And actually, contrary to what he says here, I see more side effects with that because of that big swing than I do uh, with with something that has a more steady dose. Uh, um, uh, you know, like, a, well, the sub-Q injections would be a pretty steady titer, typically, because you're doing it every day, which goes back to another thing, kind of defeats the purpose, right, mm -hmm. um, of, of something that's hysterified. But if I can keep from going off on tangents here, um, the, the creams typically are not as effective in terms of satisfying why the patient came in to begin with, you know. Decreased libido, decreased sense of well-being, decreased energy, decreased ability to to um, to change the body composition, increased muscle, decreased fat. So, uh, I'm not a big fan of creams. They're also something you have to apply every day. Wait five minutes to dry, another 25 minutes to be fully absorbed before you can do anything with it. You run the risk of contamination. Meaning, you know, if you've got a child that likes to sit in your lap and you just put it on your thigh and you're wearing shorts, you know, there, there there's issues that come with it. Not that you can't get around those issues, but the other thing too is, um, in regard to the side effects, what I've seen with these is uh, you're going to see much more uh, metabolites, many more metabolites of uh, testosterone. So you'll see, for example, higher titers of dihydrotestosterone from daily dosing because the body doesn't like those big swings, so it tends to overreact, if you will. Uh, again, that's just been my experience. but. Um, I don't know what the dose is, again, I'm stating, so I don't know if, if you've even experienced therapy yet because the thing about testosterone is 
and we've known this since the 1950s, I swear I've said this before, uh, back then they used total serum testosterone, 800 nanograms per deciliter was sort of the cutoff, below which the patient didn't get any better with clinical symptoms, above which patients said, hey, this is working. So you spend a lot of your time uh, outside of that range. Now, you don't treat numbers, you treat people. But that's part of the problem is that this, this delivery system is just going right through the skin and then your body's metabolizing right then and there. And you might be lower the next day than when you walked in the first day at the office once you've been applying this for a while. Now, again, the object is to, you know, to get to the cheese. And if you feel better, great. But a lot of times um, you have so many issues with this. Uh, if you're not a good transdermal absorber, you can't get enough in and people have to dose twice a day and dose twice as much. But um, again, you, you deal with this greatly, widely swinging uh, tighter and guys are up and down. Now, if someone comes in, comes in with very low testosterone to begin with, they think that these creams are the best thing since sliced bread because feeling better for two or three hours is better than not feeling yeah. any better, right? Yeah. But invariably, once they go from a cream to an injectable, something that's esterified and therefore time released and keeps a steady tighter up above that you know, it's different for everybody, but the average is roughly 800 nanograms per deciliter, then they feel better. If they don't hit that, they don't feel any different. And, uh, uh, you know, testosterone is interesting in that regard because it's that therapeutic threshold uh, that's a minimum under which you won't, you won't feel any better, but over which it really doesn't matter where you go. I mean, it does. Because, as I said earlier, the, the body doesn't like the big swing. So if you go really high, much higher outside of homeostatic range, the body's going to try and convert more testosterone to other metabolites, estrogen, uh, dihydrotestosterone, et cetera. But with TRT doses, okay, you're not going to hit any you know, ridiculous numbers. Um, but it's still outside of the normal limits. So doctors are hesitant to give a therapeutic dose. Yeah. I hope I circled back yeah. and, and made the point that I was trying to make uh, from the beginning is that, you know, uh, we don't know. So, so let's get down to brass tacks. 200 milligrams per ml is a typical starting dose with a, uh, you know, a delivery system that gets it through the skin, you know, pretty well. 200 milligrams per ml of a, an esterified form of testosterone injectable per week, okay, is, is also um, the number that's typical, a typical starting dose for guys that are in the business for a long time. You're all just like, you know, I think Baylor's is probably the best in, you know, don't, don't, don't send me letters, but you know, I'm partial to Dr. Lipschultz and his group of fellows, but I think they've, they've, um, they've established this for a long time, uh, you know, through a lot of studies that go back 50 years even. Um, so to get back to the questions here, instead of my riffing, um, I don't think the cream is as effective. I'm not a big fan of subcutaneous injections because um, on the one hand, you can inject yourself every day or every other day. And, of, and that kind of, like I said, defeats the purpose of, of having a sterified form of testosterone. If you want to do it once a week, it's very difficult to avoid having what I would call a big bleb, a big spot where you've got this... Uh, this oil base that's not being absorbed. You're putting it in fat. There's not much vascularity to fat, so it takes a while to absorb it, which is a, it's a boon in some respects, but then you got this thing that can become infected and just become a source of aggravation, we'll call it. Um, so you, you gotta weigh those two. Uh, am I missing anything about anything else? Uh, just, I would make sure that you follow up with testing to see what your assays are so you can see if you're not getting results, if if it's because you're underdosed, again, mm -hmm. I can't tell by pumps. ACG is not going to do it at, at, at 41 years old, typically. Now, ACG can still be used because we have receptors for um, uh, LHCG. Again, they're homologs, so they're so close to one another in structure that they combine them uh, in, in labeling them. But you have some of these receptors in the brain, and when you, when you go on um, TRT, you're not going to be producing LH anymore, uh, or certainly very little. So there's a case made that can be made to go ahead and supplement with HCG just for that reason. But for cosmetic reasons, so you avoid uh, testicular atrophy, for fertility reasons to preserve fertility or attempt to, uh, you could use HCG. But for testosterone replacement therapy, 
I think somewhere around 30 years old, you got to weigh pros and cons and, and decide if you're, you know, want to take a chance to see if it works or not, because awesome. it typically doesn't. Thanks, Doc. Sure. What else we got? Hello, Doc and Jay. Jay. I don't know why we said that. <laughs> <laughs> it's just channel. You mean JTV. Big Dave. <laughs> JTV. I'm a 24-year-old male, healthy and in good shape, and I'm an ex-Division One athlete, and I'm now in my first year of medical school. Congratulations. Previously, I've used Osterine for two months and experienced nice gains without any known side effects. All right, well, I stand corrected again. No. <laughs> uh, I did not have any labs done. This was about two years ago. So you don't know if you had side effects with your lipid profile. I bet you did. Uh, I have heard you say that you do not recommend SARMs because of the effect it has on HDL. We were just talking about this. Yeah. For someone my age, what would you recommend as a performance enhancer if you do not believe that Osterine slash SARMs are worth the risk? At my age and being healthy, should I stray away from all performance enhancers? Was this a loaded question? <laughs> uh, I do not want to jeopardize fertility prostate issues further down the line. Okay. How old is he? Does he say? 24. Okay. 24 right, year old male. Let's see so I go back to uh, hopefully what I finished, but maybe didn't with the earlier question. By 26, I think then you can feel certainly safer about using this without worrying about disrupting the formation of the, of the HPA axis. But at 24, you know, it's better than 20, but I think you still might be in that, that, risk is it a high risk not necessarily not in my experience but still i got to be honest with you that it wouldn't be something where i could say because you can't say much of anything in medicine with with 100 certainty but i say hey you're still taking a chance again um i plead ignorance with SARMs because there's so many out there now that i don't have experience with and uh there aren't studies to support their use what they're doing their side effects um but I believe that as with anabolic steroids, SARMs are going to uh, come with the same issues, meaning you're going to lower HDL and raise LDL. And as, I, as I said earlier, is that necessarily a problem, especially long term? No. Um, but I would make sure you don't have coronary artery disease, uh, and at 24 that's probably not going to be the case, but again, uh, you don't want to be the one in a million, so mm -hmm. make sure. Can I ask you a question yeah. though? When you say you can disrupt the axis before 26, if you did do that, what could happen? Well, then you're permanently on replacement therapy because the axis doesn't form, it doesn't operate properly, and you typically have lower levels of testosterone for the rest of your life. I see. I've heard people like you know, that. The, the formation yes. of this intercommunication between the hypothalamus, pituitary, and the adrenals doesn't work anymore. It okay. you know, hasn't been fully formed. I've seen it restored. I've seen it where you go, okay, yeah, you started when you were 18 yeah. and they come in at 20 and with ACG and some other things, sometimes uh, uh, clomiphene, now in clomiphene, uh, off-label use uh, is, is, is used, but we can, you know, because they're still 20 and they're still, you know, presumably six more years worth of development, we can reset, oh, you know, see. the boards that have been crashed by this introduction of a SARM or sometimes an anabolic steroid or whatever. Uh, so it can come back, but again, if you don't want to take a chance, I got you. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying, you know, I'm giving you the sort of the rules of the game from what I've yeah. seen. Um, so at, at your age, would I do it? Um, you know, as a doctor, I would have to say, for the reasons I just stated, it would not be wise. Yeah. And I certainly would not be the one to prescribe something like that because uh, I am a doctor. As a registered libertarian, I mean, you know, again, I'm not telling you what to do, but just know what the risks right. you're, you're taking. Right. Um, uh, let's see, at my age, oh, fertility and prostate issues, absolutely, that's, that's one of the things that you're risking affecting, <clears throat> and again, it would be a long shot to permanently uh, jeopardize fertility, <clears throat> excuse me, in my uh, experience, I have never, and it's rare that you can say that, but as long as I've been practicing, I've never seen fertility that was lost not be able to be restored if someone took an anabolic steroid or testosterone replacement uh, for physiological reasons. I've seen it though for psychological reasons. What do I mean by that? I've seen people that said, okay, well, I've got a fertility test, a semen analysis that shows I'm not producing any sperm or I'm not producing enough that are modal or have the right morphology, et cetera. No, no viable sperm. 
and they're told to come off of testosterone, which is one way of doing it, okay? Your body should restore itself to its natural state, whatever that might be, but they can't do it because after three months of being miserable and it hasn't reset enough yet, they go, okay, forget about it, I'm not doing it anymore. So for that I, that reason, I've seen it, rarely even, but it is, you know, it doesn't prove or disprove anything, I guess, but mm -hmm. for those that said, hey, I wanna do this, either by using HCG in a relatively high dose. And again, I learned this from Dr. Lipschultz, 3,000 IU every other day, okay, uh, until a fertility is restored. You can stay on TRT and still get your fertility back. Gotcha. You can also pull off the T, like I said, and, 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 and uh, speed the results up or amplify them both using HCG with, with no T. So it's, it's not like uh, in that regard you're jeopardizing fertility, again. I can't say with absolute certainty, except I can just tell you what's happened in my practice, not yeah. what, would, because there's probably a one in whatever chance that it can happen. Prostate issues, though, uh, again, at 24, you're probably not going to see any issues with this in a large prostate because of, uh, you know, super amounts of conversion to DHT or anything like that. So um, the, the issue, though, we do have to consider for the prostate. We know that uh, all males have the gene for prostate cancer, and it looks like it's activated uh, that gene or those genes, plural, uh, by certain estrogens, particularly in the estrone family. There's actually a 216 alpha hydroxyestrone test that used to be used mainly for women, but could be used for guys too, that shows that balance. Um, I just get an estrone, a sensitive estrone, so, you know, an LCMS so we can see, you know, precisely enough to be accurate what the estrone levels are. Uh, because uh, in a general sense, we can tell, okay, that amount of, uh, that particular estrogen is going up too high and that group contains the, the ones that are considered bad. So for that reason, I know that's somewhat Byzantine and, and, and not directly anyway because of ACG or SARMs or, uh, you know, and I say that uh, SARMs, most of them don't convert to estrogen, the ones I've read about, right? Okay. So, so that's, a, that's a good benefit. Um, but you know, we just don't know enough. And we still don't know enough about anabolic steroids like right. uh, Anadrol that's been around forever. It doesn't convert to estrogen, but boy, it sure has some estrogenic side effects, right? So yeah. uh, again, you're rolling the dice and I'll leave that alone for now, but um, <laughs> uh, I, I don't think that you're necessarily directly creating a prostate issue from what little we know, um, but it's possible unless you control some of these um, uh, potential estrogenic effects. And remember, especially at age 24, um, until the, the SARM use shuts down your own production, you're gonna have, depending upon the, the uh, affinity for the, and, uh, the AR, the uh, androgenic receptor, you know, you may displace testosterone or at least beat it to the receptor so you'll have a lot more testosterone floating around that can convert to these estrogens. I know, again, this sounds like pretty uh, Byzantine, but it, 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 I've seen it happen, at least as judged by the assays and seeing the elevation in estrogen because presumably, you know, the testosterone's floating around with nothing to do until, again, the body realizes, oh, well, we don't need to produce this much anymore. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Thanks, Doc. All right, Doc. Okay, so I looked at this question briefly, and it was too long for me to read through, so I'm going to try it uh, once again. But I have to say up front that uh, based upon what, what little I picked up, um, i got to remind everybody that you know, I, I, I can't be giving medical advice here. I'm just really interested in providing information here, but not medical advice per se. I this is uh, such a long, and you'll all see, uh, question, statement, whatever you want to call it, you know, case history. Uh, you know, I, I, I definitely don't want to be involved or even accused of, of trying to, to uh, present. Um, Dispensing medical advice over to you. Yeah, yeah exactly, yeah. because I, it just, it's, it, this is not the way to do it. It's, yeah. it's, it's wholly inadequate. But I can give some general comments and information, okay? So it says, hey, Dr. Rand and Dave, many thanks for answering my previous question on the show. You want some follow-up questions before, so there you go. Testosterone and cardiomyopathy. Uh, there's another issue that really bugs me, and I hope Dr. Rand can help. When I went on TRT about three years ago, 250 milligrams of testosterone and anthate intramuscular per week, felt just great, energetic, full of life. I've also been on dutasteride for male pattern baldness, 0 0.5 milligrams a day for also a couple of years, never noticing side effects here. About six months 
After about six months on the TRT, I decided to add a small dose of anastrozole, 0.25 milligrams every other day, just as a preventive measure. Okay, that I don't follow, but okay, I'll keep going. I never experienced any symptoms of high estradiol. I just felt great. At the same time, I decided to lower my dose of dutasteride to 0.5 milligrams every three days, just to see if a little bit more of DHT would make me feel even better. By the way, here in Germany, we live in, we live in the deepest, darkest medieval when it comes to TRT. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard enough to get prescribed just the tea, especially in an appropriate dose, let alone the anastrozole. Sorry to hear that. Uh, but since then, everything slowly went downhill. I noticed a bit of anxiety creeping up in me every now and then, and my sense of well-being slowly faded away. It happened within a couple of months and only got worse to the day. Now, experience night sweats, low mood, anxiety, fatigue, moodiness, irascibility almost every day. I experimented a lot with my dose of testosterone and natural and dutasteride, but nothing seems to help. SSRIs, selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors, SSNRIs, another form with, that blocks nor norepinephrine uptake, uh, what are considered generally as antidepressants, only help with the anxiety, but now but not the low uh, mood fatigue. Tried high dose sertraline and venlafaxine. One's an SSRI, one's an SSNRI. Uh, uh, currently I'm on 150 milligrams of sertraline daily. For the last couple of months I injected 125 milligrams of testosterone and anthate twice weekly, subcutaneously, and took 0 0.25 milligrams of anastrozole the day after the injection. See how we're going through quite the case history here? Mm -hmm. Even on that low dose, my E2 recently tested below 5 picograms per milliliter and later below 20 picograms per milliliter. I know that the ECLIA <clears throat> usually overestimates the E2 levels. So I think it would test even lower with the E2 sensitive assay. <clears throat> Sadly, we have no access to anything else then ECLA, ECLIA in Germany slash Europe to test the E2 levels. Long story short, <laughs> could it be that I'm hyper responding to even a small dose of anastrozole and or never got and or never had high estradiol to begin with, and therefore now really oversuppress my E2 over time, causing all the mentioned symptoms. Best regards, Andy. Boy, it'd be really funny if I just give you one answer. And one word answer. Yes. <laughs> uh, yes, actually. Um, y you are correct in that uh, an estradiol, the standard test, is pretty worthless for guys. Because I think I've said this before, too. It's, it's not precise enough to be accurate for a male because we have such low levels that we want to maintain. So I've seen uh, on the same blood draw for whatever mistake was made uh, more, than, more than several times, an E2 serum and an E2 uh, sensitive and one said 16 the other had said 164 that's how far off they can be okay and it's not just typically an underestimate it can be an overestimate so contrary to what maybe you've experienced Andy I've seen it on both sides so that's an issue but if we can only judge by the clinical signs and symptoms then yes uh, what you're talking about here sounds like an oversuppression of, of estrogen um, Typically, too much estrogen can lead to moodiness and irascibility, but I have seen it where um, not enough estrogen causes um, everything from joint pain, um, you know, palpitations, night sweats, um, typical signs of, of lack of estrogen, uh, decreased mood, some anxiety that comes with the palpitations, fatigue. So, um, yeah, I, I, you know, based upon what I'm hearing, I, I think the first thing I would do is pull back on the anastrozole, which if I'm you know, scrolling through this, uh, if I'm correct, it sounds like you were not using anything but dutasteride for a while. Now, if you back off on the dutasteride, which by the way has a five-week half-life, so, you know, uh, be careful what you're assuming here when you're making these changes because that means it takes a long time for it to get out of your system, the, the, the dutasteride. And once you start backing off on the conversion from 
or a, a blo from blocking the conversion from testosterone to dihydrotestosterone, you're going to have um, less ability, if you will, you'll, you'll typically see less conversion from testosterone into estrogen because you, you've turned the tides a little bit this way, right? Uh, you're allowing more of the testosterone to flow to, to dihydrotestosterone. Does that make sense? So that could be part of the reason why all of a sudden you were doing fine and now because you have less estrogen being produced, you're not doing as fine. And then of course adding, albeit a small amount, everyone's different. Uh, I, I do have a rare few, but it's a, a, it's a goodly number of, of gentlemen that, that don't need any anastrozole. It's rare. But, you know, in tens of thousands of patients, it shows up plenty of times. Um, so I don't think it's so much directly because of the dutasteride adjustments. I think it's more of the adjustment, you know, with the nationals. So as I said earlier, you know, the, the, one, an, the one word answer is yes. I think it could definitely be because of the, the estrogen that you're having these problems. Um, I'm sorry that, you know, you jumped on, and I don't know how old, say, uh, how old you are. But uh, just very, very briefly with the SSRIs, there's a lot of different reasons why you can use an SSRI or S, uh, NRI um, that are wonderful. Um, chronic fatigue, uh, you know, there's, there's reasons for it. But if it's just for low mood, by the very definition of the DSM-5, the Bible for psychiatry, if it's in your genes, it's going to show up in your late teens, early 20s. Now, assuming that you're you're, you're in the system and can be diagnosed properly, uh, that means if, if you're not uh, diagnosed with that by then, it's not in you. Unless you get in a car accident and changes your brain chemistry up here because of an accident or some sort of trauma, that's different, physical trauma. But uh, a lot of times people will be placed on these for anxiety and mood uh, disorders because their T levels are off or their hormones in general are off. So it's kind of stirring the pot up a little bit here with an extra variable that I, you know, if, if it's possible, uh, I would suggest that, you know, again, in conjunction with a physician, you go over some of this and say, okay, do we tease this out, you know, slowly and see what's going on here? Because it does make it a little bit more complicated to figure out what's going on here. But I really think it, uh, that the first thing I would pursue with your physician is, is uh, maybe backing off on the, on the quarter milligram of an astrozole and use assays, because I don't see any reference to, to assays here, um, except for the E2, which again, in this case is not valuable to us. Um, uh, and I realize the, the difficulty with getting an E2 sensitive, so you kind of stuck with clinical for the E2, but you can also use um, other uh, markers to see what's going on, uh, including dihydrotestosterone and some other uh, cholesterol-based hormones. Um, God, I don't know. I, I want to give you, uh, you spent a lot of time writing a question. I want to give you as much as I can. The only other thing I'll say here is I'm not a big fan of subcutaneous injections. There are plenty of guys who swear by it, okay? I get it. It does work for some, but I've also seen it be a disaster. I'm thinking of a pretty famous trainer, a uh, good friend now in Texas, who switched over to this and the wheels fell off the wagon. Libido fell apart, energy fell apart, body composition fell apart. Wow. And we couldn't figure out what it was. Actually, he did it without telling me about it, and then came in to try and fix it. And sure enough, you know, it was kind of easy to go, well, when did this happen? Let's go back to before you made these changes, and let's see if it restores it. And he just went back to an IM once a week, and bingo, everything resolved. So some people can deal with the subcutaneous, some people not so much. And I have no studies to support it, but, you know, there, there, there may be something to having a weekly spike in the amounts, in, you know, the, the, the tighter of testosterone and maybe some of the metabolites to, you know, um, you know, as opposed to having a nice, relatively steady tire. I don't know. Um, so that's the best I can tell you at this point. But definitely, you know, I, I would get involved as best you can with a physician, I, I presume, in Germany. and Maybe tease out the SSRI if you can. And see if it, you know. See if you can uh, raise your uh, estrogen levels. Be on the lookout, however, for signs of estrogen excess, which would include water retention, fat retention, uh, moodiness, and irascibility, which is already there. But it's, it's really kind of a different kind. 
Um, and of course, uh, you know, nipple sensitivity, gynecomastia developing. Thanks, Doc. Thank you.